This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad and live today. I'm the kind of person that when tasked with a job, I like to complete it and I like to do it well. But obviously things don't always go as planned. When I was a senior in college, I worked as a custodian in the science building, sweeping and mopping the stairwells Monday through Thursday, 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. That morning alarm would come way too fast for this college student, but I was disciplined enough to roll myself out of bed, hit the shower, get dressed, and head on over to work. It was like clockwork. My body began to be conditioned to follow this routine each and every day for an entire school year. That is, until the week before spring finals of my senior year. Here's the stage. It was a Wednesday morning and I woke up to the phone ringing in my dorm room. In a foggy and confused state, I glanced over and squinted at the numbers on my red alarm clock, which read 6.07. Oh man, my alarm didn't go off. Now I didn't dare touch the phone because I knew who was on that other end. It was my boss. I couldn't believe it. I slept through my alarm. I was totally embarrassed and I had no idea what I was going to tell my boss but I had 23 hours to figure something out. Thursday morning rolled along and you can bet I was up on time. I didn't sleep too well that night, keeping one eye on that clock over there while one eye was shut. I nervously walked into the custodial office that morning and my supervisor surely said to me, Eric, we missed you today. Well, I countered, sorry, I had some studying to do. Nice one, nice one. 23 hours to concoct a stellar excuse and that's all I got? I mean, seriously? Shirley's never going to believe that. But it didn't really matter what I said. I could have said anything at that point. Made up any excuse. It didn't matter to Shirley. For what she said next, it was the death blow that I had not expected. She said, Eric, well, since this is your last day working here with us, we had planned a surprise going away party for you yesterday. Ugh. Oh, my heart, it just sank into the pit of my stomach. But surely she didn't relent. She said then, she goes, hey, Eric, here, we saved you a piece of cake. Oh, man, I felt horrible. I made a mistake. I messed up. I let my boss and my coworkers down, and I ruined their party. I think it's debatable which is, which is worse, you know, being disappointed by someone or disappointing someone else. Either way, both elements are found in the parable of the wicked tenants in the Gospel of Matthew. Now here's how that story goes. An owner provides all the necessary resources for tenants to take care of his land and produce a fruitful harvest for him in the vineyard. So then he leaves entrusting them to take care of it. When harvest time comes, he sends two different sets of slaves over to go and collect the payment. And what happens? They end up being killed by those tenants. Thinking that the tenants will certainly respect his son, the owner sends him to collect what is owed, and the son, too, experiences a similar fate. Now those listening to Jesus tell the story come to the correct conclusion that the next step taken by the landowner would be to put those wretches to a miserable death and to lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give produce during the harvest time. Jesus tells this story in order to foreshadow the events that are to come. He's entered into Jerusalem up to this point. He overturned the tables and the temple. He's managed to anger more than a few of the religious authorities. And now here he is comparing those same religious authorities to the wicked tenants in this parable. He is accusing them of not only disappointing God, but purposefully defying God's will for his people. The tenants in the story have one job to do, and that job consists of generating a harvest of produce and delivering that produce to the owner. Pure and simple. It's as easy as that. That is the agreement. It's the expectation. Do your job and do it well. Yet the tenants blatantly ignore the owner and forget who's boss. They confuse their role of being stewards of the owner's land with ownership of the land itself. So greedily, they attempt to seize the land that they are instructed to manage, and ultimately it results in their own demise. 
for the religious leaders, this parable, it speaks right to them, hits them right in the heart. Jesus is accusing them of not doing the will of God and predicting for them a downfall that has eternal connotations. These leaders have not lived up to the responsibility that is expected of them. For these guys, they're well-versed in scriptures. They've heard what Jesus has preached, and yet they continue to ignore all of this in order to push their own agendas, to flex their own muscles, and to satisfy their own desires. Their backs are turned against away from God, and the result of this perpetual behavior will not be pretty, and it certainly will not be desirable. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he asks the question, he says, how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when you're sitting there with a log in your own eye? In other words, all of us, all of us, we aren't off the hook. It's easy to look back into history and say, hey, check out their bad behavior, when what we ought to be doing is recognizing our own current state in regards to our relationship with God. Whether we are unintentionally straying from God's will or blatantly disobeying Him, it is imperative that we turn to the Lord with a repentant heart. By not doing so, I hate to say the consequences that await us, but when we turn to our Lord in an act of confession, we see that His arms, they are extended wide, ready to embrace us with an unfailing dose of mercy and love that is on demand for all believers. Once our strained relationship is restored and we are in good standing with our God, once again for the umpteenth thousandth time, our eyes are open to the possibilities that await us as faithful servants. We realize that our calling is to not, not to disobey like the wit, wicked tenants, but rather to produce a fruitful harvest that benefits and that builds up God's kingdom in our world today. The Apostle Paul writes in the book of Galatians what a fruitful harvest might look like. Paul says that the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If we truly are grateful for what God has done for us, if we cherish the loving relationship that has been established by Jesus on the cross, then these are the fruits that we need to work at producing, each and every day. The message, it's loud and clear, and we don't want to disappoint. Our alarm clocks, they're ringing, and we are being summoned from our disobedient slumber to wake up, to turn to God, and to get to work. We are now able to move upward and onward, striving to be faithful to God's will, knowing that our misdeeds have been forgiven, and that Jesus has secured for each one of us a little slice of heaven. Amen. Remember as you go about your day that yesterday is gone, tomorrow does not yet belong to you, so why not live today knowing that you never walk alone? See you all next week. Later.